So, church, would you stand with me as the word of the Lord comes up on the screen? And we're going to be reading uh, from the New Revised Standard Version, Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 12. This is the message to the church in Pergamum. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum, write, These are the words of him who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know where you are living, where Satan's throne is. Yet you are holding fast to my name, and you did not deny your faith in me, even even in the days of Antipasus, my witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you where Satan lives. But I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the people of Israel so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. So you also have some who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. Repent then. If not, I will come to you soon and make war against them with the sword of my mouth. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give a white stone, and on the white stone is written a new name that no one knows except the one who receives it. Father, as we look to your word uh, this morning, as, you know, as, as we've, we's, we've reflected and, and, and have sung together, um, Lord, there's this renewed decision to, to follow you. And, and we, we recognize that, that part of that following you as has been expressed over the pages of, of your word is this recognition that there needs to be this decision of stripping off that which is old, that which, which hinders us in our pursuit of you. So may we have ears to hear, may we have eyes to see those areas of our life in which you are saying uh, this is no longer to be held by you. And um, so we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Feel free to have a seat. Been in a a series for about the past four weeks now um, through the Revelation chapters 1, 2, and 3. Um, in Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus is giving um, words to seven different churches that are in the province of Asia, um, which would be modern-day Turkey. And um, to these seven churches, Jesus is giving a specific word about what he's noticing about them. They're very intimate and, and, and present words that Jesus has with them, because as, as we find out in Revelation chapter 1, he is the one that is amongst them. He is the one that is right there with them, and so he, he's able to see very well what they're dealing with, what they're wrestling with, what the areas in which he's giving them accommodation. You're being faithful in this area, but then he also has these areas of their life where he's saying, I have this against you. These are the areas in which he desires to bring refinement and wholeness uh, to them, and there's this call of repentance that he has uh, to the churches. Um, And and love to remind you that if you go to our website or even just to the URL, faithsandiego.org slash revelation, um, you'll see a bunch of resources there for helping you navigate the book of Revelation because we recognize uh, it is not the easiest book uh, to dive into. And so with great, hopefully with, with context and resources, it'll help you explore uh, that book in, in your own time or this book in your own uh, personal time. But the church in Pergamum. I grew up in a neighborhood uh, that was, I, I suppose you could use the words that was plagued with, with theft. Um, we often um, experienced in that neighborhood that I grew up with in uh, car robberies. And I remember as a kid one day as, as I'm in the kitchen, um, the, and I'm in the kitchen with my family, we look outside where the car is parked, where our truck is parked, and the door is open to our truck, and we notice that someone is uh, rifling through the glove compartment of, of the vehicle. And in that moment, well, at that, uh, my mom is there in the kitchen. She takes off out of the house, confronts the guy, and just starts wailing on him. And so there's my mom 
beating up this guy that's stealing uh, from our vehicle. That same house, um, now when I'm in college, I'm living away from, from home, but I came back home uh, to visit family for the weekend and to get a good meal and to do my laundry. Um, but as there, I'm there at the house, I'm uh, sleeping on the couch uh, that night, and I wake, I'm woken up about 6.30 in the morning with a knock on the door, and I open up the door, and there standing before me is a police officer. And uh, I say, yes, <laughs> what would you like? And, and the police officer responds, uh, who is the owner of the Nissan Stanza? As the, are they here? And it was under my dad's name, Valente. And uh, I said, well, he doesn't, he's not here. Uh, and I said, but that's my car. Um, even though it was registered under my dad's name, it was my vehicle. And, he's, and the, the police officer says, uh, well, it was involved in a high-speed chase last night. <laughs> Would you like to report it stolen? I said, yeah. Yes, I would. That was not me. That was in that high-speed chase. Thank you very much. And uh, so I'm told, okay, it was found in the neighboring city. We lived in the city in L.A. County called Norwalk, and the car was found uh, in the city of Bellflower, which was next door, and I had to go, and I had to pick up the car, and by the time I drove the car from Bellflower to home, which was about only three miles away, the car completely overheated, and it was a stick shift, and they, like, burnt out the clutch. Um, insurance covered it all, but again, theft was just a normal part of there. Um, I'll tell one more story. I remember as a kid, my, my dad sometimes watches uh, the sermons on a later date, and I'm, I hope that I've told this story um, before, um, but if not, here's the news now. Um, as a family, we were visiting my grandma's house and uh, her and my uh, great aunt's house, who also lived in a neighboring city, in the city of Artesia, and we, didn't you guys remember when back in the day you didn't have to wear seat belts and you could just hang out in the back of a pickup, like the bed of the truck? Like what up, what's up with that? But you just could, and we used to play a game where you'd roll around in the in the back uh, of the bed. I'm trying to go quicker here, but um, we had the camper over the top. We had a, the shell over the top, and so we were there. That's where we were at, driving into to the neighboring city to visit my great aunt and my uh, grandma's house for Christmas. And so all the Christmas presents are in the back of the truck with us there in that camper shell. And uh, we park, we visit my great aunt, and then um, when we come back to the car, all of the Christmas presents are stolen um, before we can go visit my grandma's house where all my cousins were. And we had to show up and just give them hugs because all the <laughs> Christmas presents were stolen. But the point of confession, Dad, is... Uh, I'm the one that left the back window open to the camper shell that they got in uh, to there. So I just lived with this shame as a young kid uh, for someone else's theft. So some, some neighborhoods we can see in overt ways deal with, with points of brokenness. Uh, in, in a lot of neighborhoods, in some ways, we can, we can see very clearly in front of us the the things that are being wrestled with and dealt with in that region. But what we can also recognize is that there are a lot of neighborhoods around us that maybe in more hidden ways are dealing with these pervasive problems and these cultural issues that are at play. You might think of materialism or workaholism or snobbery that might exist within uh, a neighborhood. Have you ever been on a neighborhood app? You know these apps that you just scroll through and you get to hear all the conversations that are happening around your neighbors? And you just scroll through that thing and you just see all of the things that the neighbors are complaining about and, and, and ranting about and you just go, oh my goodness, I had no idea all of these underlying conversations and problems that existed around me. Maybe across this room there exists wild stories about neighbors, about difficult neighbors, and we could probably spend the morning going around the room and just sharing stories about interactions that we've had with our neighbors, the neighborhoods that we've grown up in, the neighborhoods that we, that we lived in. Maybe we can even talk about the homes that we lived in and, and maybe the points of underlying dysfunction and, and unhealth 
that existed in our environments. For the church in Pergamum, man, it was the challenge of neighborhood on a whole other level. Jesus comes to this church in Pergamum and he says, I know where you live. It's where Satan's throne is. <laughs> I mean, you think about your difficult neighbor. Now think about the church of Pergamum, where Jesus comes and tells this community of believers, I know where you live. That place, ooh. Just musicians in the room, just heart just completely sunk right now, huh? I'm Where were we? <laughs> Jesus comes to this, this, this church in, in Pergamum and he says, listen, I know, I know where you're at. Where you live is where my faithful witness, Antipas, lived, where my faithful one was at. I know where you live. You live where Satan lives. And, and this word that Jesus gives to the church in Pergamum is, listen, the, Pergamum, the church in Pergamum didn't decide, hey, you know what, let's go move in with Satan. But what the recognition to them is, is that the, the city that you happen to reside in just so happens to be where the, the effects and the culture and the ways of Satan are so pervasive amongst you. And I see it. And I see it. And maybe for all of us in this room, we can stop and we can hear a word from the Lord that says, I know your environment. I know your pressure. I know the challenges that you're navigating. Maybe for some in this room, it's just this recognition that just says, hey, listen, that hostile work environment that you navigate from nine to five, Monday through Friday, that place of tension that you, that you so often have to, to live in, for any of you that have, have navigated a rough household as, as a child, listen, this is this place of Jesus coming to a church and saying, I know, I know your environment. And, and I see you being faithful. I see you being faithful. And the word from Jesus to Pergamum, you can, you can, man, if you just sit with it, I imagine that you could just see the, the, these words of love and care and compassion flowing out of Jesus. He comes to them, and did you see how personal he gets here with them? I know where you live, where you live, he says it this way. You live in the days of Antipas, my witness, my faithful one. You see how personal Jesus is getting here with the church? My, my guy, my guy Antipas, I, I, I see you. I see the place that you're living in. And I see that you're trying to be faithful. And let me take a quick aside to talk about our geography and to talk about our location. Because one of the things that you'll notice when, when you sit with, with Scripture is that you'll notice that so often, it's not every single time, but so often that the authors of Scripture are very intentional about how they describe our geography. And what I mean by that is that when you look through here in Revelation chapter 1 through 3, what you'll see John doing is you'll see him saying, listen, I'm writing this, I'm John, and I'm writing on the island of Patmos in the Spirit. And when he writes here to the church of Pergamum, he says, I know where you live. You live where Satan lives, but you've been faithful in me. And what, what, what is not so subtly done here by the authors of Scripture is by revealing to us the true location of our abiding, of where, where our home really is. You may be, I'm going to say it like this way, you may be on San Diego, but you're in Jesus. 
And you may be walking through that circumstance. You may be going through that scenario, but where, where you're at is in the Spirit. That's where you reside. And that word here, what's done here by John, is giving us this, this, this deep level of security and comfort and understanding. You are held tight in Jesus as you navigate that difficult environment, as you walk through that difficult season or space of life. But we can't get around it. We have to talk about Satan for a little bit. <laughs> Because one of the, the, the very big themes here in this letter to the church in Pergamum is Jesus tells them, you live where Satan's throne is at. You live where Antipas is at, where, and that's where Satan lives. C.S. Lewis gives us this perspective and some advice here as we begin to talk about Satan um, together. He gives us his advice from, from the screw tape letter, letters. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased, the demons are equally pleased by both of these errors and hail a materialist or a magician with the same delight. Right, and so we may be in a place where it's just like, man, the devil is everywhere. The devil made me do it. The devil is the one that, that, that caused all of this theft to happen in my neighborhood. The devil is like just playing tricks on me in my life. And there's just like this abundant, no, just overwhelming interest in Satan and what he's up to. But there's also this other error which we can get into and just say he's not real. And he's not at play in the world around us. I got some scripture, I got some resources um, for you. If you can go to the next slide, just because I recognize we won't have the ability to, to do a really deep dive uh, into the theme of, of spiritual beings and demons and Satan. Um, the Bible Project has an incredible um, series of videos called the Spiritual Beings series. All of this, by the way, is now linked on that Revelation resource uh, page. So you can go to there, faithsandiego.org slash revelation, and you'll get us um, some resources on spiritual beings. Um, Kurt Thompson, I just came across this sermon actually this last week. He preached a message on shame that was so good. And he talked about the impacts of shame and what's actually happening in our bodies in those moments that we have shame and the way that Satan uses shame to manipulate us and, and play on our desires. And so he preaches this sermon from Genesis chapter three on the serpent interacting with Eve and the way that shame plays out um, in our bodies. John Mark Comer has an incredible read. Uh, I'll tell you right now, this will probably very, very likely be a summer read um, that I'm going to invite us into. This will be our, our book for the summer. Um, and John Mark Comer does kind of a classic reflection on the three enemies of our soul, uh, this, uh, Satan, the flesh, and the world. And he talks about what does it look like to live in a place of peace as we recognize those three enemies um, at play in our lives. Um, so three resources for you. Um, but here's, here's kind of the flyover for us. Satan is a created being. He is not God's equal opposite. What is very clear to us, especially in the book of Revelation, is Satan has an end, but Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. Right, that's, that's the, the recognition here. We recognize that Satan is not omnipresent and omniscient. What that means is that he doesn't know everything and he's not everywhere all at once. Those are qualities to God and God alone. Um, but what we do know is from the words of Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 10 is this. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it abundantly. And so we recognize that, that Satan is pro-death, 
and he's pro-destruction. And so wherever there is beauty, wherever there is flourishing, wherever there is unity, wherever there is truth, Satan is out to destroy it. And we might ask the question, well, but I thought he was defeated on Good Friday and Easter Sunday. So why do we still have to deal with Satan at work in the world if Jesus conquered him on, on that holy weekend? And John Mark Comer in that book, Live No Lies, frames it this way. Jesus' victory over the devil was like D-Day to World War II, the decisive battle that marked the beginning of the war's end. The devil's fate was sealed on that first Easter as Hitler's was on June 6, 1944. But there are still many miles to cover to reach our equivalent of Berlin. In the interim, the devil is like a wounded animal, a dying dragon, more dangerous than ever. And that's, that's what was, is happening here in this letter to the church of Pergamum. You live where Satan is at. You live in this world. You live in this environment and this city where the destructive ways of Satan are still at play in the world around you. And Jesus gives us insight on how Satan accomplishes his acts of death and destruction. What is regularly recognized when when Satan is described is that he is the father of lies, that he is a deceiver, and and that he's an accuser. And so we recognize by those descriptions of Satan is that he, he, what he seeks to do is to play on our own understanding, our own interpretation of what good is and the inclinations of our hearts. And so the tools and tactics of Satan are so often to spin things for us so that we might go, huh, that makes sense that way. It's not just like this overt attack from the devil, right? We might have, because of, of, of modern day art and our, our, our pictures, you just kind of imagine a, a, I don't know, Daffy Duck or whoever, Donald Duck in a horn costume kind of a look, that that's what Satan looks like, and it would be so obvious to us of him at play in the world around us. But the description to us over the pages of Scripture is that he's cunning. And the way that he interacts with us is that he plays. He plays with our desires. He entices us. He causes us to go, go along with him because it's this place of going, yeah, I can see how it works that way. Satan gives to us a distorted picture of reality. Satan plays with our definitions of good and the inclinations of our hearts. And so maybe it looks more like We think about those destructive tapes that play in our mind about ourselves and our relationships and the ways that that they can just sound so good and true to us. Maybe it's the way that our worldview suddenly becomes shaped by this place of saying, I need to look out for my own well-being and I need to look out for the well-being of my people first before anyone else. I need to, to, to consider my fears and my insecurities uh, right here, right now in this scenario. And so it just kind of like, yeah, it makes sense to us. It's like, yeah, I should look out for me and my people first. And it plays on this selfishness and, 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 and again, the, the, the false inclinations of what are good. And he plays on, plays on our places of hurt And our disappointment plays on our, and you see him with with Eve in the garden of like causing this point of like, did God really say that to you? Or suddenly Eve's understanding of who God is, 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 is messed with and played with. 
When I think about this, I think about, I, I was walking um, just down a path with one of my kiddos, and as I was walking, um, my boy just randomly did this to a plant. And I stopped and I asked him, I was like, why'd you do that? And he looked up at me and he said, because I wanted to and it was fun. And in that moment, I stopped and I was just like, yeah, I get that. I understand that, that movement. I understand that, that space to be in. For him, it was just the space of just going like, it made sense. Like I, just, I wanted to kick the plant, so I kicked the plant. And so we paused there in that space, and I just simply asked, like, is your fun the most important thing? And the answer was direct and simple. Yes. <laughs> and I stopped and I said, hold up. Let's chat through that. But I get that. I get that mindset. I get that understanding, right? Like, as we just said, okay, let's, let's do it at like a level. You move my hand. I said, what's more important, your fun or your friend's safety? And I was grateful he grabbed my hand and moved it up. He goes, my friend's safety. What's more important, your fun or that plant? that plant. But a lot of times it's just really simple for us, right? Like we have these inclinations of our hearts. We have our definitions of what is, what is the good life and how we get there. And, and the influence of Satan in the world is to say, yeah, your, your well-being, your fun, your prospering, that's most important your people, your tribe, your nation, they need to be considered first. And it just makes sense to us. And so suddenly we begin to live in the world in a way that just goes, other people are to be feared and controlled. Other people they're a threat to me. There's not enough in the world. I need to consider me first. But let me really briefly here connect Satan to the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans, because I imagine that as you read through this, uh, this letter from Jesus to the church, you might be wondering who in the world are this community of people that he's writing to. Like, hey, you've got these false teachers that are amongst you. Uh, the teachings of the Balaamites and the Nicolaitans are at play uh, in, in, your, in, your, in your church. The Balaamites, and I'll fly through this um, pretty quickly here. If you look through the book of Numbers, in Numbers chapters 23 through around 25, um, in the book of Numbers, we're introduced to a king in a place in a city called Moab. Uh, this king, his name is Balak. And what's happening here in this scenario is Israel, by God's hand, has just been brought out of Egypt, and now they're moving into the land of Canaan. And as they're doing so, it's a whole nother sermon that we could get into, and a whole nother conversation. God is, is doing this work of, of judgment and deliverance of the land in Canaan, and he's using Israel to come in and to conquer all these different cities and, and peoples that are in that region um, called Canaan. Balak observes that, that, that Israel is moving in. And so, so Balak goes and gets a prophet named Balaam, and he tells Balaam, what I want you to do is I want you to speak a word of cursing upon the people of Israel as they're coming into our land. Right, and so so Balaam does. He goes. He will. He postures himself to speak a word of cursing over Israel. And as he's about to do so, he hears from the Lord, and the Lord tells him, "Those are my people." And so Balaam goes to Balak, and he says, "I can't do it. 
I can't speak a word of cursing over them because God has pronounced his favor upon them. There's no way that cursing can be spoken over them. So Balak puts him in another location. And he says, try it again. And he tries it again. And God speaks to him. And Balaam says, oh, sorry, Balak, I can't do it. And so then he takes him to a third location. And there, what Balaam ends up doing, he ends up pronouncing blessing over Israel when Balak was asking him to speak cursing over Israel. And you look at that story in Numbers 10, 24, and you're just like, man, this is incredible. God's hand is over his people. And there's this really odd turn that happens in Numbers 25. In Numbers 25, it starts off by telling us, and the men of Israel began to have sexual relations with the Moabite women. And here in Revelation chapter 2, we're given insight from the Spirit of the Lord. What Balaam did he recognized there's no way that we could speak cursing over the people that God has in his hand. But we can entice them. We can play at their desires. And so that's what's been told to us here in, in Revelation chapter 2. Let me read it to you. Because I have a few things against you. You have some there who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block where the people of Israel, so that they would eat food sacrificed to idols and practice fornication. And here, in connecting Satan to the Balaamites and the teaching that's at play in amongst the community of God's people, is this: You're in Jesus. You're in the Spirit. You are safe and secure in the hand of God. Satan cannot, does not have the power or the authority to just curse your life. But he can entice you. He can play at your desires. He can stand off here and provoke something within you to where you decide that you might pursue that which is unhealthy and untrue, a distorted reality about the world. The Nicolaitans, it's a whole lot more difficult to discern, to discover uh, what's happening there with this group of people, but what you find is, is I, the, the teachings that I've come across that make sense, at least from my understanding, is that this word Nico and Laetin can be uh, translated to be conquered and people would be the, the Greek translation of that. So there's just something about their teaching that is causing destruction to God's people. And, and it's just this word to the church Would you pay, pay attention to those small inclinations? Would you pay attention to those small destructive habits and teachings amongst you? And it lines up with the rest of Scripture where these small desires would lead to an action. These small actions would lead to a habit, and these, these habits would then eventually lead to death. And the challenge to the people of God is that we would be we would be aware and we would be vigorous about saying, what is it that might need to be rooted out in my own life that may put me on a pattern to death and destruction? And church, as you read these words, what I find so important for us to recognize is that these words aren't from Jesus to Babylon but they're from Jesus to Pergamum. And why that is so important is that when we think about Satan at work in the world and, and destructive patterns at play in worldviews and, and approaches to living, Jesus' word isn't, hey, church, do you see how Rome has these bad actions and habits amongst them? No, the word is to Pergamum. There are teachings amongst you that you need to pay attention to. 
And so if we approach this word by stopping and saying, yup, look how perverse and destructive the world is, then we're reading this letter to Pergamum wrong. What the, what the challenge to us is, is that we would approach this word and then with open and vulnerable hearts, we would say before the Lord, what about me? What do I need to pay attention to at play in my own soul, at play in my own worldview, at play amongst my people, amongst my tribe? What is it that I need to pay attention to? And the last thing that I want you to observe here is, well, I'm going to say two things that I want you to observe here, is notice the location of Jesus' weapon. He comes to this church and he tells them, he's the one with the double-edged, the sharp double-edged sword, but it's not in his hand. He's not coming to smite the church. He comes and he tells us the sword's in his mouth. And so what we recognize, if you could bring it up on the screen, right, he says, I repent then, I'll come to you soon and make war against the sword of my mouth. Immediately, I think we're to connect with Hebrews chapter four. Indeed, the word of God is alive and active, sharper than two-edged sword, piercing and until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It's able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And what we're meant to do, I believe, is, is the act of repentance is to come before the Lord and say, Lord, are there any intentions in my own heart that you would call me to repentance of over? Is there anything happening within my own soul that you want to refine and deal with? And then the last thing that I would have you notice is this, is, is Jesus comes and he tells the church in Pergamum, Look at the Balaamites and what, Bala got the Bala what got Israel to do is to eat food that was sacrificed to idols. And that's intentionally worded there because he tells them what the reward for those that endure and conquer to is manna. And, and the intentional connection here is just by simply asking us, listen, in your day-to-day -day living, whose table are you eating from? What are you ingesting? What are you bringing into your life? And, and that's, that's what we just find here is whose table are we sitting at? What Balaam and Balak got Israel to do is to, is to bring into their life and get into the hidden spaces of their life, idolatry and fornication. They gave over the hidden, and small areas of their life to the pursuits of other gods. Oh, but remain faithful so that you might just see provision and abundance and a blessing from the Lord. Church, would you stand with me? Let's pray. Father, we just... I just ask that you, you would have access to our inner desires. Lord, I think about the, the, that teaching from Dallas Willard that I heard so long ago about you are the God who gives us the desires of our hearts. And that, that being... That you just don't that we have desires and that you grant those uh, to us, but Lord, that you are the one that's actually shaping our desires in the inside of our hearts. You're giving our hearts desires, and so would we be a people that know what it is to to draw near to you, to be aware of your Spirit speaking to us? Would we be a people that come before you and say, Lord, form us, shape us, mold us according to, to who you are? Would we be a people that are following you? Lord, you have access. Lord, you have access to every space, every corner of our lives. And so we come before you, Lord, recognizing that it isn't to stir up shame or condemnation within us, 
but to lead us to wholeness and healing, that you might call out those hidden spaces of our lives where we are entertaining death and destruction, and that you call us to life. You call us to enjoy the manna from heaven. May we delight in you, Jesus. And so we pray that in your name. Amen? Amen. Amen.